Let me give you a story of my, uh, of my youngest son. It's called the broccoli story. <laughs> Have you ever heard this? All right, so uh, my son always knows because we you know, teach him about health and nutrition. My son always says, I'm like, do you like broccoli? And he's like, I love broccoli. I love it. It's amazing. Broccoli is like the best food ever. And then when I say, uh, Jacoby, we have broccoli. Do you want some? He's like, actually, I'm not very hungry. <laughs> Are there a lot of people who say, hey, being healthy, that's really a good idea. And I love health. I love being healthy. But when you say, when push comes to shove and say, here's what you need to do, people are like, actually, I'm busy today. <laughs> so I love the fact that you guys are actually here. And I know that you're busy. You have a million things to do. Me too. But she actually said, no, this is a priority for me. And I'm actually going to do something about it. So there's a lot of people who say, I really want to know about stress. Will come to this talk and they say, actually, I you know, have other things that I would rather do. So thank you very much for actually being here. You guys ready to learn about stress? All right, okay. Today's actually gonna be really fun. And just like Leanne said, you may even get offended. <laughs> and I don't mean like I'm offended, like I'm gonna you know, like talk about your mom or anything like that. But sometimes when you say something that is absolutely so true, usually the truth really offends you. Let me give you an example. If I dropped this right now and I said, uh, I don't believe in gravity and I dropped it and it drops, you know, do you guys get offended? No, why? You're like, I feel sorry for Dr. Nate because he doesn't believe in gravity. But you're not offended, right? But a lot of times if someone says something that's true in your life that you know that you need to change, your first response is what? I'm offended and you get defensive because it actually hurts. Uh, raise your hand if you're this person on the left where you just kind of wave the, right, the white flag of life and say, I give up, like I just can't do it anymore. Some people are like that, right? <laughs> then you got some people too. Uh, you got some people too, which um, those are the people that you know are heading in the wrong direction and they don't see it yet, okay? Um, these are the people that we like to say are the ones that jump out of an airplane without a parachute and halfway down, you say, hey, how are things going? And they're like, so far so good. But the thing is, is they don't have a parachute and they're about to realize the effect of jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. So my job is to do this. If you're over here, uh, let's, help you, let's help you not raise the white flag. And if you're here, then let's give you a parachute so that we can help you. Make sense? All right. So I want to go and uh, just spend a little time in the day of the life of probably you, all right? Now, all these may not be true, but there have been true at one point or one point or another in my life. And because a lot of times people say, well, how did I get here? How did I get stressed? Or how did I have uh, poor sleep? Or how did I have depression? Or how do I have anxiety? And the thing is, is that when you look at depression, anxiety, poor sleep, digestive issues, things like that, it's never one thing. It's not the fact that you ate too many Oreos. It is multiple things that you are doing over time. So how many of you, how many of you, number one, need an alarm clock to wake up? Yeah, all right. That means you have a problem with what's known as your circadian rhythm or your cortisol levels, number one. Number two, how many of you hit the snooze button three times? <laughs> number three, how many of you in the morning say, good Lord, it's morning? Or say, good morning, Lord? <laughs> so a lot of people start off their day like that. And then as soon as they get up, they go and they reach for their cell phone, check their emails, check their Facebook, check their Instagram, check their Twitter, check their social media, their Pinterest, and they check all of that. And the reason why you check that in the morning at first thing is because you suffer from something known as FOMO. You know what that stands for? Fear of missing out. And many times, as soon as you start checking that, your brain starts to realize saying, Oh my gosh, look what I missed. Look what I missed. What well, I have to deal with this. I have to deal with this. I have to deal with this. So then you actually start your whole day starting off feeling like you're behind the eight ball in a high stress state. Then you get ready and you actually leave 20 minutes early so that you can spend 20 minutes in the drive through at Starbucks. <laughs> Don't these people realize I need my Starbucks? And one of the things I realized, because I, I don't drink coffee, but my, you know, my wife does sometimes, and it was like a Sunday at like noon after church, and she's like, I can go to Starbucks. And we go to Starbucks at noon, and we waited 15 minutes for a coffee. But people are willing to do that 
because they need a shot of caffeinated beverages in order to wake themselves up just to get back to tired. But the thing is, is how many people actually will say, I don't have time to exercise, but I do have time to spend 20 minutes in line trying to get my first shot of caffeinated energy. And then because we spent 20 minutes, we're behind the eight ball, so now we're late for work. Hey, I'm late for work. So you guys, raise your hand if you do this. You go to there, this, the, the light turns red and there's two cars in front of you in two lanes and you're like, which one is gonna get off of the green light the fastest? Mm -hmm. right? So you choose the one you think has got the, the heaviest foot and if they don't accelerate right away, burr, 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 burr. you know how many times people do that to me? Literally, if I don't accelerate within a fraction of a second, but you're already in a high stress state. And then you get to, jo and get to work and you know what it is? It's deadlines, it's emails, and it's lazy people that you work with that don't want to do their job that are asking you to do their job for them. Raise your hand if that's true. And then it's lunch. How many of you eat on the run with lunch? Eating on the run is one of the top reasons why people have digestive issues like reflux. So then you eat on the run and then you go to Panera for your $11 sandwich. But hey, at least it has arugula so it's healthy, right? <laughs> And then you down this in five minutes because you got to, get, got to get back to work. And then after work, then it's off to our three practices that we have to go to because all of our kids are playing sports because they're going pro, right? I mean, they are going pro. My kids play sports too, but how many of you have seen this whole like travel baseball, travel basketball industry that so many parents feel pressured to get into because they have the fear that their child is gonna be left behind in their athletic development. But there's this whole culture and this whole industry now where parents are more concerned about a child's athletic development more than they are about the development of their character. Can I get an amen about that? And so, hey, if we don't win this game, Johnny won't be able to go pro. You're a terrible volunteer ref. I actually saw uh, a, a dad uh, actually quit a game, take his whole team off of the field because he disagreed with an ump that was making $25 an hour uh, on a call. And he said, I need to show my, teach my kids a lesson that you know, we play the game right. And here the kids were actually just saying, we just want to play. <laughs> and it became more about dad than it came, became more about the kids having fun. And because we have so many practices and things like that afterwards, it's on the way home, it's picking up something quick to eat, right? Well, listen, it's just this once. Or is it actually the 27th time you've done it this month? <laughs> and then afterwards, we get home, the kids go to bed, and then we want to detach. And a lot of times we detach, we may watch the news, we may watch NBC, CSNBC, CNN, Fox News, whoever you're watching, it's all bad news. It's bad news about this side, or it's bad news about that side. Donald Trump did what? You know, the global warming, the hurricanes, and the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And then you're stressed out more about it, and then you wonder why you can't get to sleep at night. So then in order to try to, to you know, get to sleep or detach your mind, it's more on Facebook or social media. It's more screen time. And then you're like, I can't believe Karen is taking her third cruise this year. Can you believe that? And all of her kids made the all-star team. My kids would have made the all-star team if it wasn't for that terrible volunteer coach. <laughs> and then it's more outrage as a result. You see like through your day, and this might not be exactly your day, but you know what? You have these little stresses, these little stresses, these little stresses that keep actually stressing out the adrenal glands and actually stress out the, the brain. So is it any wonder why most people are spending their whole entire day at 211 degrees? You know what I mean by 211 degrees? Where does water boil? 212. And most people spend their whole day at 211, just underneath that boiling point. But most people are starting out their day in a stressed state. And that all of these little stressors start to raise the temperature inside of their body. And then finally, all it takes in order to trigger you is not something big, it's something what? Little. So like I said, I was asking my staff, and I said, hey, I got a question for you. I said, when do you deal with people uh, erupting at you at the front desk? You think it happens here? 
Yeah, occasionally it happens that I have to train my staff on how to handle it correctly. Because I said, when someone erupts at you, it's not necessarily that you did something terribly wrong, it's that they're coming in in a high stress state and all they need is just one more thing before they finally actually lose it. Have you guys ever just lost it and you're like, that's not me, How, why, did that, why, why did that actually trigger me? It never should, because all it takes is just one more stressor before you lose it. And I said, well, when do you think it happens? When do you think you have the most people who do that? And they said, when? In the morning or in the evening? And I said, it's in the evening. So most of us are spending that on, the, on our actually close to that boiling point. So here's the thing with stress. You realize this. This is true with all disease, is, is this. Is that everyone always thinks it's one thing. There's like, what causes cancer? And I'm like, many things done all at once. Oh, so you think it's sugar? Does sugar cause cancer? And I'm like, well, I know some people who eat a lot of sugar who never get cancer, right? Or they're saying, what causes heart disease? It must be cholesterol. No, it's not. It's many things. And so it's, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease, whether it's depression, whether it's mental illness, whatever it is, it's never one thing. It's never one thing. It's a collection of many things that are done repeatedly over time. And it's the same thing with stress. Because we think it's just one thing with stress. You know what? It's my, it's my husband. I got to get rid of my husband. If I get rid of my husband, all my stress is going to go away. No, it's not. Because you divorce your husband and guess what? Your life still sucks. The thing with stress is it's never one thing. Stress is like death from a thousand paper cuts. And what I mean by death from a thousand paper cuts, if you get a paper cut, does it bother you? It's kind of an annoyance. But what if I put a thousand paper cuts on you all at once and what happens? You die. So when they mean by a death from a thousand paper cuts, it's the, the accumulation of all these micro traumas that eventually will actually kill you. So here's the thing. We think when I'm going to handle my stress, we think we just need to fix one thing. And that might be a start, but we want to fix one thing, make massive changes, and we only want to do it for a week. And after a week, it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, I guess I'm just supposed to be stressed out. But really when you talk about fixing these, this, the whole mechanism of stress and all the stress that takes place in your life, it really is about understanding that there's a lot of little things that are going on in your life that you are not might not be tending to in the way that you're actually supposed to. So really what it comes out to is you have to start addressing all of the different stressors, all of the different paper cuts that are actually making you sick. Here's the thing, the CDC says this, 90%, this is amazing. 90% of the reason why people go to a doctor is what is it for? Mental stress. So when I tell uh, men and women, we're reading labs with them and things like that, and I always say, you got to get your mental stress under control because does mental stress contribute to every disease? Every single one, and I'm going to show you why. So. Mental stress, does it, deal, does it affect your digestive system? I'm going to show you why. Does mental stress affect the heart, heart and heart disease? I'm going to show you why. Mental stress, does it actually affect depression? I'm going to show you why. Does it actually affect your thyroid? Oh, you better believe it. Does it affect your hormones and your fertility? I'm going to show you why. Does it affect your sleep? I'm going to show you why. Men, does it affect your testosterone levels? I'm going to show you why. Does it affect your ability to lose weight? Absolutely. I'm going to show you why. When I show you this picture, what's the response that happens in your body? <coughs> get out. Yeah, right? That's a great answer, is get out. So I want you to think of this, because we think that the stress response is bad. Is the stress response good or is it bad? Really, it's always good. It's just the problem is, is that you're triggering it too much. So think of this, if we put you in a room like this, we closed the doors, we shuttered the windows, and we didn't give you the ability to get out, and you're stuck in this room. And let me ask you something. What happens to your blood pressure? What happens to your stress hormones? Do you guys get a little bit anxious? Do you think your pupils dilate? Do you think your respiration starts, starts to uh, uh, accelerate? Do you think that all of the blood supply to your uh, organs starts to get shunted away into your extremities? so that you can actually punch through a wall or try to get out. So all of those things happen and those things are actually good. And why is it good? Because if you are in a room with a fire, that physiological response to your body called the stress response is designed to help you deal with that crisis 
and help you deal with that emergency to help you get out of that room. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. Now let's say, right when you think you're about to die, I open the door and I say, Lexi, come on out. All right, come on out. Go over right here. We have a medical doctor who's going to check you out. Medical doctor comes and he's got his white coat on and he says, puts on a blood pressure cuff, measures your blood pressure. Lexi, your blood pressure is 280 over 160. You have high blood pressure. Then he looks at your blood, looks at your thyroid. Your thyroid is actually starting to tank a little bit. I think you have a thyroid issue. And then he actually uh, says, how are you feeling right now? I'm really anxious. You know, you probably need an antidepressant. And then he uh, you know, looks at your digestive system and says, wow, it looks like your stomach's not working. It's not digesting food. Here, here's a proton pump inhibitor. We're gonna help you digest your food a little bit better. And so if you looked at all of your blood work, you would actually see that you're sick. He would diagnose you actually as, as being sick. So when you think about it, the doctor does this snapshot and looks at all of this lab work that's, that of you in a stress state and says you have all of these different conditions, but he's gonna say you need to be on these meds for how long? Forever. Forever. And all they're doing is they're looking at a snapshot of where you're at, but do they ever ask you about the stress you're going through? Or do they ever look and say, we need to find the stressor? Because if he would have actually just looked and said, oh, I see you're just locked in a room that was on fire, now I understand. Okay, we took you out of the room, you're gonna actually be just fine. So once you remove yourself from the stressor, then you have to let your body be able to recover. But that's our medical system. You have high cholesterol? Oh, well, here's your cholesterol med, and you have to be on it for how long? Do they ever follow up and actually see if they're improving your life and, and helping you remove the stressors so that you're not on those medications for the rest of your life? So this response, when it happens, is absolutely great. It's, it's only there to help you. But the thing is, is this. Long term, there's going to be a consequence. So here's the rule number one. Plug your holes before you try to bail out the boat. Does that make sense? Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, I went to Lake Geneva. You ever been in Lake Geneva? They said it's the second deepest lake in Wisconsin. It's like 180 feet deep. I'm like, and I have, a, I don't have a fear of deep water. Oh my gosh. I'm like, if it's like six fleet swimming pool, I'm like, I don't know if I want to go in there. My feet can't touch. But think of this. If I'm in a boat, a rowboat, and I'm going halfway through, and I'm probably going to get a little nervous, but I notice my rowboat, like rowing across Lake Geneva, starting to fill up with water. The, the first thing that most people do is they start freaking out and they say, get a bucket and start bailing this out. But really the first thing you should do before you start frantically bailing the boat out is what should you do? We got a leak. We need to find where it's coming from. Plug the hole, then we'll bail out the boat and it will be so much easier. Other than saying, I'm just going to sit here for the next eight hours and I'm just going to keep bailing the boat out. You got to plug the hole before you start to bail out the boat. The reason why I say this is you know how many times people say, Dr. Nate, um, I have uh, not sleeping very well. Do you got a supplement to uh, help me with my sleep? And I'm like, uh, let's figure out why this is happening. Well, uh, well, what does that mean? Well, let's figure out why. Let's actually get the right test and let's figure this out. Nah, I just want a supplement. That's all I want. The thing is, is that they, then they'll start taking a supplement because Dr. Oz said it was good for sleep. And then it may work a little bit or it may not work. And then they say, well, the supplements don't work. I guess I just need to be on a medication. And by the way, what's always going to be more powerful, a supplement or a medication? 100% of the time. A medication will, if you are looking for a, an effect of helping you sleep better, a medication will always work better. Now, I'm not saying that if you're taking a medication for sleep, you're really not sleeping, you're just unconscious. You're not restoring, having restorative sleep. But so many times our people are looking for, what can I do to just bail myself out? And meanwhile, I'm saying, no, what can we do can it, to actually plug the holes? Because once we plug the holes and we start fixing the reason why the boat is, is taking on water, then you know what will actually be a lot more effective to help bail out the boat? Supplements. So here's the hormones of stress. Number one, you guys ever heard of cortisol? Okay. 
So cortisol is made by the adrenal glands. How many of you have heard of the adrenal glands? They sit right above the kidneys. They're only about this big, sitting right on top of the kidneys. And one of the hormones that uh, the adrenal glands release is actually cortisol. Here's what's really interesting, fun fact Saturday, about the adrenal glands is there's actually two parts of the adrenal glands. Not only is it a gland, but it's also neurological tissue. On the inside, it's neurological tissue, and on the outside, it has glandular tissue, which means that actually the adrenal glands is almost like a secondary brain, a, a second, like an extension of the brain. So you got two parts. On the outside of the glandular tissue called a cortex, it actually releases a hormone that's known as cortisol. This is your stress hormone. Cortisol, what's the main purpose of cortisol? Cortisol is actually designed to actually raise your blood sugar. So many times when your blood sugar gets low, your body will release cortisol. Cortisol says, hey, we need to mobilize sugar from our liver, mobilize sugars from our uh, stored in our muscle tissue, and we need to actually bring that blood, uh, that, the, the blood sugar back up. So that's one of the purposes of cortisol, okay? So it's called a stress hormone. Now, epinephrine and norepinephrine, what's another name for this? Adrenaline. So you ever heard of adrenaline? This is actually produced within the neurological tissue of your adrenal glands. These are called your catecholamines. Now, when you actually have this stress response, guess what happens? Well, like, let's say, for example, you see something really scary, and all of a sudden you, hear, you feel this boom, and then you feel something like in the pit of your gut, and then what happens is, is then you start to see like your heart rate elevate, and then your breathing starts to get more. Yeah, and that's what adrenaline is actually doing. Now, you have your estrogens and your progesterone. Now, what are these? These are your female hormones. Men need these also as well. So your estrogens are responsible for uh, like development for women of their sexual organs. Estrogens are actually primarily needed to actually release the egg during your menstrual cycle. So estrogens are important, and then you also have progesterone. Now, do men need progesterone as well? Absolutely, but mostly usually women are the only ones that say that they need progesterone. Now, progesterone is actually for women, your estrogens from progesterone are actually produced after menopause by your adrenal glands. So your adrenal glands, even before uh, menopause, uh, will produce a little bit of estrogen and progesterone, but after menopause, that's the primary place where you're getting your estrogen and progesterone is from your adrenal glands, which means after menopause, you better take care of your adrenal glands and you better not be stressed or else you can start to tank these hormones. Now, progesterone, the reason why we have progesterone for ladies in particular is because progesterone is actually what helps to maintain a pregnancy up until about you know 12 weeks. So you need healthy progesterone levels, and then, the, um, then after that, the placenta will take over with, uh, with progesterone. But progesterone will help to prepare the uterus for uh, having a pregnancy. So every 28 days, the uterus gets prepared, and it starts to thicken in order to, to pot the possibility of taking on a fertilized egg. And then once the egg doesn't get fertilized, what, ladies, what do you have? Then you have your menstrual cycle for seven days in order to strip and get rid of all that tissue and then rebuild it all over again. Progesterone, by the way, is actually for ladies what makes a lady feel great, which is why so many women are taking what? Exogenous, meaning from the outside, progesterone. Why do women take it? Because they do a test and they say, wow, your progesterone is really low. Here, let's just replace it with a progesterone patch or some kind of bioidentical hormone or some kind of cream, whatever it might be. And then they say, wow, I feel so amazing. I don't ever want to stop taking this. And then when you measure, though, what happens over long term, you can actually see that it can cause a lot of negative effects. And then you have testosterone. Ladies, do you need testosterone? Absolutely. Men, do you need testosterone? You better believe you need testosterone. But why does a lady need testosterone? Maintenance of your bone mass, uh, sexual desire, sexual drive, the ability to lose weight, the ability to, to uh, uh, burn fat, the ability to burn muscle or build muscle. So you absolutely 100% need testosterone. And then you have thyroid, okay? So you have thyroid. So you got your T4, T3, and you got reverse T3. You got some other ones. But I want you to think of this. What does your thyroid hormone actually do? What does it do? 
The thyroid gland and the hormones it produces are primarily responsible for regulating your metabolism, okay? So T4 is actually your inactive. By the way, what does your doctor usually just measure? People send me their blood work and they have one measurement, that's it. TSH, that's a brain hormone by the way, it's not even a thyroid hormone. And then they look at T4, do you guys know that T4 is actually the inactive form of thyroid, meaning the body doesn't use it. So the thyroid produces an inactive, meaning the body doesn't use it, and then it has to be converted into T3. Where does that conversion take place? Of T4 into the usable form, the active form of T3 in order to increase your metabolism, regulate your metabolism. Do you know where that's converted? Primarily two places, liver and the gastrointestinal system. Which means if you've got liver problems and gastrointestinal problems, guess what? You may have normal levels of this, and this may be absolutely tanked, and the doctor says, you're completely normal, because they don't measure it, but you say, but I feel like garbage, okay? Now, the reason why I'm going over this is because reverse T3, this is actually the brakes on T3. Reverse T3 is actually the body saying this, whoa, we are under some kind of assault here, attack, or some kind of big time stress. Let's put the brakes on this and let's slow down your metabolism. Because if a bear is chasing me, what do I want to do? Let's slow down the metabolism and try to hold on to everything as much as possible and become really efficient at using energy. Which by the way, you don't want to do, right? You don't want to be efficient at using energy because we live in the United States. We don't have a problem with food. Does that make sense? or with finding food. So these are gonna be the actual hormones of stress. This looks like a really big picture, but I want you to get the idea of how this actually happens. So remember with stress, it's not all mental. It can be chemical, it can also be physical. So think chemical, what do we mean by chemical? Well, it can be like what you're eating, or what about physical? Physical would be like having trauma to the spine, to the, uh, to the head, that's affecting the function of the nerve system. So you have all of these different stressors, but think of this. Let's say you have a mental stress. Let's say you see danger. Let's say you're just sitting here and here comes a bear and he's barreling towards you at 35 miles an hour and he weighs 4,000 pounds. So your, your eyes see this danger. The eyes will send a message to a part of the brain known as the limbic system that is designed to sense danger and is designed to then send a message through the sympathetic nerve system. This is a division of your nerve system that goes down to the adrenal glands and connects to the neurological portion of the adrenals and says adrenaline and it immediately starts to get you ready to be able to either run away from the bear or if you're really stupid to try to take on the bear, right? Now the other things that are gonna happen is anytime that you have the stress, then you'll also through that limbic system it's gonna send a message, a message to the hypothalamus, which is just a collection of nerves, and then they then will send a neurological uh, a, a message to the pituitary gland. So do you guys know where a lot of the stimulus for you to be able to make healthy hormones actually starts in the pituitary gland? So the pituitary gland is gonna release a hormone into the blood called adrenocorticotropin hormone. And then that goes through the blood supply eventually ending up on those adrenal glands and it says hey when this hormone is sensed by the adrenal glands it says we need you to release this stress hormone it's called cortisol so this happens right away this happens through the hormone system and it happens a little bit more slowly so this is like right now but this is a long-term type adaptation so here's what happens when you combine these two it's going to increase your blood sugar is that a good thing Bears chasing you, it's a great thing. <laughs> you need a lot of energy. But what happens if you keep having this stress response over and over and over? What happens if I have chronically elevated uh, blood sugar? What's that called? Diabetes. Type two diabetes. Do you know that every case of type two diabetes has a stress component to it? In fact, I was actually talking to a guy, he's like, yeah, my dad has type two diabetes. And I'm like, how much does he weigh? He's like, skinny as a rail. Has like has not, you know, and I'm like, does he has he stress, stress, stress or had problems with stress and mental issues? He's like, yeah, for his whole life. And I was like, you can stress yourself into having blood sugar issues and type two diabetes. 
because there's always going to be a mental component to it. How about constriction of your blood vessels? So what happens is, is primarily your organs will constrict, the blood vessels will actually constrict. The reason why they do that, which is a good thing, is to actually constrict and shunt blood away from your organs into where? Into my extremities to run faster, to jump higher, to be stronger. That's a good thing. However, if I'm chronically constricting the vascular supply around my heart, what does that lead to? Heart disease. How about having an increased blood pressure? Is that a good thing? Of course the heart needs to beat harder. The harder the heart, the heart beats, the more blood you're getting to your extremities. That's a good thing. But long term, can that cause damage? Absolutely. How about slowing your digestion? Do you care about digesting your Burger King when a bear is chasing you? <laughs> no! So digestion will completely shut down. And, and the thing is, is when you look at the vascular supply, in an unstressed state, most of your blood isn't in your extremities. Most of your blood is around your gastrointestinal system trying to digest your food and take the nutrients and spread it out to the rest of the body. So anytime that you have a stress response, the digestive system stops. Which is why, have you guys ever like eaten and then you exercise and then you get cramping and things like that? Because you, you decreased all the vascular supply and you stop the digestive problem, you got a bunch of rotten food in your belly. How about tightening of muscles? Is that a good thing? Yeah, did you guys know when you tighten muscles, they become more reactive, they become stronger, they become quicker. But that's a bad thing too, because where do you guys, where do you think most of your muscles actually tighten? People tell me all the time, oh, I'm under stress and I just feel it all along my spine. Primarily the, the muscles along the spine tighten in order to put you in protective mode. Because when you're in protective mode, what do people do? Like this. And so when you're in protective mode, you're holding like this. And if you're stressed for six hours a day and you're holding yourself in this position, what happens? It gets stuck here. And now you are wondering why your spine and nerve system is so damaged. But you get stuck here like this, you're just halfway there to looking like your old grandma in this granny posture. And then it's going to increase the inflammatory response. Is that a good thing? Because if the bear comes and slashes you to pieces, the immune system is already there saying, hey, we're ready to start healing you. But it's also not good over the long term. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? All right. So just like we said, this is a good thing when a bear is chasing you. And it's not a good thing if the bear, you wait, if the bear wakes up with you every morning and says, are you ready? I'm coming to chase after you. It's like you guys both get up and you're like, hey, George, you ready? All right, let's go. And every day the bear is chasing you for the next 18 hours. That becomes, that stress response becomes a very bad thing. But that bear that you wake up with that's gonna chase you for the rest of the day, the body doesn't care if it's a bear. It doesn't care if it's a relationship stress. It doesn't care if it's a job stress. It doesn't care if it's a money stress. It doesn't care if it's a kid stress. It doesn't care if it's a social media stress. It doesn't care. Because stress to the body, it doesn't differentiate between real or perceived. Which means every time that you have a stress response because you're worried about something, it's no different than a bear's gonna chase you. And that's why you have to start dealing with it differently. And this is why it's going to mess up your hormones. Because every time that you're having this response in which you need cortisol and in which you need this adrenaline, it's always going to favor this and it's going to neglect this. Does that make sense? Which means that is it going to mess with your menstrual cycle? Is it going to, is it going to mess with your fertility? Is it going to mess with your testosterone, with you guys, are, when you're, can we talk about this? We're not 12 year olds here, but you know, when you're stressed out, you really don't want sex. So does it mess with that? Does it mess with your ability over time to be able to burn fat as an energy source? Does it mess with your ability to lose weight? Yes. Does it slow down your metabolism? Absolutely. So it does all of that, which means the more stressed that you are, over time, the worse you're going to feel. Can I get an amen with that? All right. So here's what having high cortisol. Raise your hand if you have these. 
So chronically elevated levels of cortisol. In the brain, it impairs memory. Did I already go over this? Okay. So it impairs memory. Number two, tissue breakdown. Reason why it starts breaking down your tissue. When we're dealing with a lot of people like who work out a lot, okay, and they're chronically elevated, over time what happens is you see they start to get injured more often. And here's the reason why. Because cortisol will actually start to break down your muscles. Well, why would it want to break down the muscles? Because it wants to hang on to fat and instead it prefers to start to digest muscles instead because it wants to keep those fat stores. So instead it'll start to break down your connective tissue, which is why when you're chronically stressed, athletes, their bodies start to break down. Listen, I've been through this where I was chronically stressed and I continue to work out and what happened to my disc and my knees and everything, what do they start doing? They started getting hurt, they started getting injured all the time. How about your energy control? So if you keep trying to mobilize sugars inside your body because you're always stressed, you're gonna have less glucose sensitivity, which is really big for people with type two diabetes because they don't hear these hormones anymore, which means you need to keep putting in more and more insulin. So the more stressed that you are, the more insulin you're gonna start to release. And guess what? Insulin is not the blood sugar lowering hormone that everyone thinks it is. Insulin is actually called the fat storage hormone. So the more stressed you are, the more you're signaling to store fat. Immunity. So over time, it's gonna decrease your immune system. So it's gonna decrease your natural killer cells and it's gonna uh, decrease your interleukin too. We had a woman, we just did uh, some testing and there's this, uh, we did food allergy testing. I looked at this because she wants to lose weight. And I'm like, listen, if you wanna lose weight, just cut your arm off. You'll be a lot less weight. She's like, no, 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 I wanna look better. I'm like, well, you, you wanna look better or you wanna be healthier? You know, again, you can look better if you go get some plastic surgery or you know, do that. She's like, no, I guess I wanna be healthier. So we did food allergy testing and we actually saw like one, there's only like three times I've seen this where our immune system didn't respond at all, like to anything. And your immune system should respond to some foods because they're not supposed to be inside your body ever. And so I said, there's some kind of chronic stressor that's taking place inside of your body that is absolutely tanking your immune system. And so one of the tests that we actually wanted her to get is to actually measure her natural killer cells inside her body. It's called a CDA test because people with an, a lowered immune system response have very few of these natural killer cells. For example, like AIDS people, you know, people who have AIDS or HIV positive, their natural killer cells are absolutely tank, which is why people who have HIV, who develop an AIDS, why they actually die, not from AIDS, but they die from some weird cancer or some fungal infection or something inside of their body. So it's also gonna impair the detoxification process. And it's also going to decrease the metabolism, which you'll store excess fat around the hips, the thighs, and the waist. Uh, it's also gonna impair your recovery. So high cortisol is gonna, uh, especially at night, is gonna imp uh, impair human growth hormone. And this is actually human growth hormone is how the body repairs muscles and connective tissue and things like that. It's gonna impair your sex hormones. It's gonna cause imbalances in your estrogens and progesterone and testosterone like we talked about. And then it's gonna decrease your thyroid output. Why is it gonna do that? Because I'm stressed. And let's lower our thyroid output and it's gonna cause a lot of gastrointestinal dysfunction. You guys ever heard of leaky gut syndrome, things like that. Let's right. talk about your circadian rhythms. You guys ever gotten your cortisol checked? Like your cortisol rhythm. There's a couple of ways that you can do it. Uh, you can actually, uh, sometimes we pull it from the blood but it only gives us one snapshot of where you're at in the blood just during that day. So actually the best way to measure it is we do it through urine. So we do it, so a measurement here, measurement here, measurement here, and a measurement here throughout the day. So here's what should happen when you're looking at your cortisol levels. When you wake up, your cortisol levels should be a little bit elevated. And the reason why when you're doing this on urine and you haven't gone to the bathroom for eight hours, the urine is gonna collect your cortisol throughout the night. So it's gonna be a little bit elevated in the morning. So when you wake up and your, your cortisol start to, gonna start to go up and this is what helps you start to wake up. What happens if it's really tanked in the morning or really low in the morning? How are you gonna feel? Because uh, cortisol is gonna give you this feeling of wakefulness. So when you wake up, it should be between these two right here. And then throughout the day into like the early afternoon, it's gonna go up. 
And then after, you know, early afternoon, it goes, starts to go down and starts to taper down. And what should your energy do? Huh. And then at night, it should be really low. And then you just go to sleep. Huh. So when should you be the most awake? Yeah, from like 10 to 3 o'clock, 10 to 2 o'clock. So some people have it completely backwards, though. So look at this person here. Do you think she has a hard time waking up? Yes. Then all of a sudden, she must have a lot of stress that's going on, and she's like, oh, like this. And then when you look at this, what happens? It goes down, but it still stays elevated, high elevated. So what do you think she is? We call this tired and wired, meaning do you think she sleeps at night? And what fact, what is she like? Like, I need to go to sleep. I'm exhausted, but I can't. And these are people who are usually experiencing a lot of acute stress in their life, okay? So there's a lot of acute stress. Now, by the way, people will ask, what's the, what's the best time to work out? And I say it what? It depends. So what's the best time for her to, to work out? It would be right around here. So like late morning for her would be the best time to work out, right? This is what we call chronic fatigue. So this is like more of a chronic fatigue type pattern. So for this woman, you can see she wakes up and she's doing pretty good. And then you can see she gets high, pretty high, almost you know, too much at around the you know, late morning, early afternoon. But here's what happens, look at what happens at night. And she almost doesn't register. So I asked her, I said, how do you feel at 10 o'clock? She's like, pretty wired. I'm like, how do you feel at three o'clock in the afternoon? And she says, I need to sleep. Like I cannot even function. So this would be like going into like having chronic fatigue where eventually you'll start to see this dampen uh, even over time. So what happens is, is if you keep demanding cortisol from the adrenal glands, is it possible that they can have fatigue? Yeah, there's a, there's a medical term for it, uh, adrenal insufficiency. So if someone was looked like this and had adrenal insufficiency, that means the adrenal glands aren't even responding anymore. There's a medication that actually says you should never take this medication if you experience adrenal insufficiency. You know what medication it is? Synthroid. Yet how many times does a doctor recommend Synthroid and never ever looks at if the adrenal glands are actually functioning? Because if you take Synthroid and never measure adrenal function, you'll become very sick. And at that point, they'll just say, just take a bunch of antidepressants or let's, you know, okay? All right. Remember that steroid pathway, sex hormone steroid pathway that we talked about? I wanna show you this because this person right here had a lot of mental stress and I actually asked her about it. I'm like, there's something that's stressing you out and what is it? Uh, nothing, I'm fine. No, what is it? I told you, I'm totally fine. No, it's something, I know this, what is it? And then she finally told me. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. But the reason why she came to you is she was having terrible issues with her menstrual cycle. Uh, meaning like from like, soon as she had her menstrual cycle, like two to three days, it was like heavy. She was in bed, had a heating pad, and this had been going on for about 10 years, All right? And I'm gonna show you why that is, why that was actually happening, and actually why mental stress was her biggest barrier. So remember we talked about this pathway. The one that I showed you before that probably stressed you out had all these like other things that were going on, but when you take those away, the first thing you need to have healthy hormone function and to be able to make cortisol is you need what? Cholesterol. How many people their cholesterol are getting artificially lowered? I measured someone's uh, cholesterol, uh, someone who was just diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. Her cholesterol was at 110, which is like you're about to die because your cholesterol is too low. So where should your cholesterol be? I don't know, it depends. But definitely when you start artificially lowering it, you are, the, the liver is not able to, to actually make the foundational things in order to start making these hormones. Progesterone, right here. Ladies are like, what's my progesterone levels? Remember what you need progesterone for? Well, here's what happens, is that if you are undergoing high amounts of stress, your body will start taking these hormones in order to make what? cortisol. And if that continues to happen, then all of your progesterone pregnenolone goes down this pathway, which means it will block the production of what? 
a lot of these other hormones, including testosterone and actually your estrogens. Does that make sense? So we call it the cortisol steal, meaning if the body is undergoing stress, you know what happens? Is that it will always do this to help you get out of the emergency. And this stuff over here, it doesn't care. And it makes sense. The body is, we always think the body is making a mistake. It, it, someone told me the other day, I feel like my body is just working against me. And I'm like, no, it's not. It is trying to adapt to what you're doing to it. It's not working against you. It's trying to help you survive. Because think about this. If I'm stressed all the time, do I care about sex? Because what's the purpose of it? To reproduce. Do I want to be fertile? Do I want to bring a baby into the world being in a high stress state? No. And no wonder you're having problems with your menstrual cycle because the body says, this is the only thing that I want to do right now. And it starts to deplete all of these other hormones. Remember that Dutch test, the adrenal function? You remember that girl that we said that her, her cortisol was tanked at night? Here's what's interesting. So we just showed you this pathway right here. So if she needs to make a lot of cortisol, what do you think is gonna be high? Her progesterone. So when we measured it, here is her progesterone. So this is actually what normal should be. And you can see how high her progesterone was. And now when you look at her estrogens, look at, this is actually menopausal. So these are the menopausal ranges and you can actually see for her at 28 years of age, she, her, her estrogen levels were at menopausal ranges. So what was her body doing? It was stealing all of the progesterone in order to make what? Cortisol, okay? Now do you see why she probably had a lot of menstrual cycles, menstrual or menstrual issues? So stress doesn't just affect women, stress affects men. It, but it doesn't affect it uh, from a hormone perspective quite as much, but it still can, okay? So this is actually um, a guy, 42 years of age, not me by the way, my testosterone are not that low. <laughs> <laughs> but we measured his testosterone, okay? Because he's kind of like, Ugh. You know what happens when a man's testosterone goes low? You're like, honey, can you please do something? Why are you on the couch? Why are you just kind of, ugh, just, you, a man becomes a blob. You know, like, they just, they don't have the it factor anymore. It's like, ugh. So his wife is like, yeah, he's kind of like a blob. You know, he sleeps all the time, and yeah, he goes to work, and yeah, he loves my children and stuff, but please, can you have my, this is not the man that I married. So he measured his testosterone, and at 42 years of age, his testosterone was 210. Now on this test, they say it's normal. Your testosterone, men should be six to, six to 700, even 800. But when you look at this, you can see how low this is his free. So you have total testosterone, and then you have free. Total is one that's bound. Free is the one the body actually uses. So you actually can see how little testosterone he actually had. So what was causing the low testosterone? Well, stress was, because he's a total people pleaser, just because of the industry that he works in, um, but because he's always so stressed, he doesn't sleep, and he eats a bunch of junk food and sugar. And the two things that are gonna tank a men's testosterone is lack of sleep and doing what? Eating a bunch of sugar. Uh, because sugar will take the testosterone here and we'll convert it into what? Estrogen. And that's why a man starts developing man boobs. So how to overcome stress, fatigue, and burnout? What we have to do is we have to address these three different legs, physical, chemical, and mental. Physical, chemical, and mental, all three. Here's the problem. If you affect, if you only are doing one, can you sit on that stool? Not very well. If you do two, can you sit on the stool? Maybe a little bit better, but a stool is only stable when you do what? You address all three, all right? All right, so hey. Up